How do you present that new patient on round? How do you present that new emergency department console to your chief resident you're attending if you're a medical student or an intern? Today, we're gonna crush it. I'm gonna give you the style points. I'm gonna give you all the structure to a new patient, new console presentation. Let's do it. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon and I'm here to scale surgical education, get you more comfortable, on the wards, in the ICU, in the operating room, and of course, to crush your exams. Today, we're gonna to be doing something a little bit different. I pulled you guys, I asked, what kind of videos do you wanna hear? Many of you said that you wanted to get confident on how to give that presentation of a new console. Other of you said, man, I need to get comfortable on how to do rounds. So we're gonna put these talks together. This one is on that new patient presentation or that new console presentation I'm gonna go through all the style features, so confidence, notes, time, honesty, and I'm gonna go through all the structure, okay? So, let's get on with it. When we talk about presentations, we have two big thoughts. One is the style of the presentation, okay? And the other is the structure. Okay, so what is style? So first is confidence. Okay, you want to be a confident doctor, not only for the patient, but for your team. You want to project that image of confidence that you know what you're doing, you have the information, and you're ready to make a decision. So the first thought is be the doctor you would want for your mom, or be the doctor you would want for your son or daughter. That's the image that you want to project. Second is, if you're going to wear a white coat, make it a white coat white coat. There is nothing worse than a sloppy jacket, coffee stains, wrinkles, creases. Just iron the dang thing, wash it, whatever you got to do. Somebody is going to make a judgment on your appearance and they're going to associate that judgment with how you take care of them. If you got a sloppy coat, you're going to take sloppy care, okay? The third thought with confidence is speak up, speak clearly, be articulate, you know the patient, all right? If you know the patient, all of the right information is gonna flow, okay? So keep that in mind when you're putting together your presentation. Second is notes. So notes are okay, but you do not want to read from a script. The last thing that projects confidence is somebody who's buried in their paper. This is a 77 year old female who presents with right upper quadrant pain that is worsening. No, no. You can have notes, you can have bullet points and reference data, but don't read from it. Use it as a reference. Like I said in confidence, if you know the patient's story, the information's gonna flow. What I found with years of training new students and residents and talking to colleagues on the phone with new consult requests, is that those who know the patient really well can just communicate. They're not always referencing their data. It's not jumbled, it's not jumpy, it just flows. Okay, so think about that. And like I said, reference points are absolutely okay when you're given a presentation. When it comes to time in medicine, I think there's a pretty good rule. Your presentation is your note should be as long as necessary and as short as possible cut out the fat, okay? I think the sweet spot for a new presentation in surgery is two to five minutes. Less than that, you're probably leaving a few things out. More than that, there's prob you're probably communicating some information that you don't need, okay? You may be asked for that information, but you might not need to give it in that initial presentation. And to get into that sweet spot, remember, know all of the information about your patient but only say what you think people need to hear. So you might not need to say all of the normal vital signs. You know, the patient had a heart rate of 73, a blood pressure of 118 over 75, with a respiratory rate of 12, satting 98% on room air. You could say the patient has reassuring vital signs, and if somebody asks you, well, what was the heart rate? You can say, oh yeah, it was 73, whatever it was. Or it was 73 to 82 overnight, okay? So know all the information, but only say what you need to, to help drill down on that differential. And finally, honesty, okay? 
Medicine is a job of integrity. So don't lie. Don't ever lie. Okay? If you don't know something, I don't know is the right answer. It's really easy to find information nowadays. We're taking cows or those computers on wheels, or you have the bedside nurse, or you have the patient that might be right there, or it's easy to get to a computer. So if you haven't reviewed the labs, say, I haven't reviewed the labs, I don't know. Don't say the labs are normal if you didn't know, okay? If you haven't reviewed the CT scan and you've just looked at the report, you can say, I looked at the report, I haven't seen the imaging. Now that being said, you should always be looking at the imaging. Not only is it educational, but it's gonna provide you context to the whole patient. And we can talk about that later. So now let's get to structure, okay? In structure, we're gonna have a bunch of different things and I have them all listed right here. We're gonna go through each of them. Okay, so you have your opening. That's gonna be that one sentence bullet, okay? Then we're gonna to go to the HPI, the past medical or surgical history, we're going to get into the social family history to a review of systems. Then, of course, the physical exam. We're going to talk about results, a quick hospital course, and then the assessment and plan. Okay, so when you have each of these things, the most important thing to the listener is that you have flow. Clear communication is flow. You need to flow from that bullet right to the plan and not go backwards, okay? It's really frustrating if you're listening to a history and you're talking about abdominal pain and then you jump to abdominal tenderness in a positive McBurney's point tenderness and then you jump back to a history of nausea and then you go forward and say that they had a fever. It's really hard to listen to. So if you're able to give that flow and communicate from beginning to end, it's going to be really easy to listen to whether your listener is a chief resident, is an attending, or is a colleague and you're calling them for a consultation. All right, so let's get to the opening. So the opening is that one line bullet, okay? So Jason is a seven-year-old male who presents with abdominal pain, nausea, and fever. Boom, then we're gonna get into the HPI. Or Casey is a newborn, born at 37 weeks gestation with a prenatal history of polyhydramnios and an inability to pass an orogastric tube. Boom, then we're gonna get on to the rest of the history, okay? So this is just a bullet that's gonna capture your listener's attention, okay? And start to get them thinking about possible differential diagnoses as they listen to the rest of the story. Okay, so let's get to HPI, or the history of presenting illness. Now in surgery, this usually has to do with pain. Now I put together a great talk on how I take a history. I use an acronym, it's called SRN OPD SARA. Put a link to it up here, all right? And that stands for Site, Radiation, Nature, Onset, Periodicity, Duration, Severity, Aggravating, Relieving, and Associated. Okay, I do it in that order for a particular reason. It helps with flow, all right? And so that's the history of presenting illness. If you have a vascular patient, it might be a little bit different than this. So how about the past medical history? So the past medical history are medical conditions, past surgeries, past hospitalizations that are relevant, and of course, the medications, okay? It's important to go through this so you can not only optimize the patient for surgery, but you may need to treat particular things, okay? So what if that patient's on steroids? and now you got to give a boost of steroids for the surgery, or what if that patient is on a blood thinning medication and you would need to stop that, or you need to have reversal agents ready, or what if the patient, need, or what if the patient has a cardiac history and you need to do a cardiac workup, okay? And with past surgery, that should be self-explanatory, right? If, if you're gonna be operating on the belly and the patient has big transverse scar here and that's crossed with the midline scar here from laparotomies when they were a baby and then an adult, you gotta know what those were, okay? So, past medical history, super important. How about social and family history? So the social and family history, I like to cover what is the living situation? So if I have a child, are they with both parents? What, how is that gonna affect their post-operative course? Or is it a foster child that I'm taking care of, okay? What's the occupation? 
Is there any alcohol, tobacco, or drug abuse? So is there a travel history? Is there an exposure history? Uh, are they a part of religion that may have an impact on their medical care? So is this a Jehovah's Witness? And you're going to have to make some decisions about blood products, which could be difficult. Okay. With respect to family history, we want to get, are there any inherited conditions amongst first degree relatives? And that's what you want to focus on. Okay, how about that review of systems? So in the review of systems, we want to report relevant information from a 12 point systems review. Now, if you got that book, Tally and O'Connor, they have a great systems review and the yes or no questions in that book. So you can check that out. I'll put a link to that in the description, but present the relevant information. So in Jason, our seven year old male presents with abdominal pain, nausea, and fever, in their systems review, you might find, yeah, they have dysuria. When their bladder contracts, it hurts. So that's gonna give you a little bit more information to maybe nail that diagnosis of appendicitis, okay? So let's get to that physical exam. So on the physical exam, again, we want flow. We wanna start with the vital signs. Now you could say something like, patient has reassuring vital signs, or maybe they're not reassuring. What are the trends in those vital signs? The patient has had worsening tachycardia overnight, or they arrived to the emergency department hypotensive, but responded to fluid resuscitation and now they're normotensive. Okay, as far as the general appearance of the patient, I have that acronym Chandler. So color, hydration, alertness, nutrition, disability, limbs, external support and respiratory distress. I talk about that in how to do that abdominal exam. Okay, so you wanna get that vital signs, the trends, the vital signs, as well as that general picture. Finally, remember to always present relevant findings and avoid saying normal. The patient looked normal and the vital signs were normal. No, give reassurance, give some context to what your words mean. So after you've done your general appearance of the patient, you've talked about that Chandler, now we're moving on to the physical exam. I like it when I hear that the physical exam starts with the part of the body that the consult is about. Okay, so that seven year old with abdominal pain, nausea and fever. I wanna hear about the abdominal exam. So do they have a soft abdomen that's non-tender, non-distended, okay? Or do they have a rigid abdomen and peritonitis? Or do they have a soft abdomen with tenderness at McBurney's point and a positive Rosving sign? Okay, so that's really important. Then you can move on after you've presented the findings of the physical exam that have to do with the opening, then you can include other positive findings. Remember, in your brain, you know all of the other findings in the physical exam. So just present the information that's gonna help with that differential diagnosis. When we get to results, all right, we wanna present relevant results, okay? So you got labs, maybe you got a complete blood count and a basic, basic metabolic profile and an arterial blood gas and blood cultures and you know, what else? Coags and a type and cross. So you don't need to go through the sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, BUN, creatinine, glucose, whites, et cetera, et cetera. You can just say we had a BMP within normal limits we had a CBC with a white cell count that was elevated to 17 with a left shift and on and on. Okay. You want to present relative findings again, that are going to direct you down that differential. Now, just because you haven't said it doesn't mean you don't know. It doesn't mean you hadn't reviewed it. Okay. So just say the things you need to say. I know that's kind of a recurring theme here, but it's really important. As I said, with a physical exam, avoid saying normal and also avoid saying negative. Okay. If you had an ultrasound of the abdomen looking for appendicitis and you couldn't see the appendix, that's not a negative ultrasound. That's an ultrasound of the abdomen where you couldn't visualize the appendix. Okay. If you had an ultrasound that showed a normal appendix, that's not a negative ultrasound. That's an ultrasound that showed a normal appendix. Okay. So it's just important when you're communicating, communicate the information. Don't say something's positive or something's negative. Give the information, give the context. So when we talk about hospital course, we can look at you know, the emergency department courses. That's very common for us who, as surgeons, are getting consults from the emergency department. So 
Were they resuscitated? Did they get antibiotics? Were there any interventions being done? Okay. In the ICU, this is also important. So what interventions have been done? What's the current level of support? Is this a patient that is intubated, ventilated on norepinephrine and vasopressin that is getting blood overnight for refractory hypotension? Okay. Or is this a patient that was extubated a couple of days ago? All right. So what's their current level of support? So now we get to move in to the gritty bit. Okay. And that's the assessment and plan. So you've moved through from the bullet to the HPI past medical history. You've done your physical exam. We talked about the results. Now you got to put it all together. So the assessment is a brief one to two sentence picture of your patient that incorporates the most important elements of the history and physical exam and results. Okay. In this assessment, you want to talk about the reason for consultation, perhaps the reason for admission, what the differential diagnosis or the diagnosis is, and then the clinical stability. All right. You say that in one to two sentences, and then you can move on to the plan. Jason is a seven year old male who presented with a two day history of abdominal pain. He's received IV fluid resuscitation and antibiotics with cefoxetin. He has a clinical picture that is consistent with the diagnosis of appendicitis. Other possible differential diagnoses include Meckel's diverticulum or Meckel's diverticulitis, acute gastroenteritis with mesenteric adenitis, and inflammatory bowel disease, but appendicitis is most likely. Once you've nailed that assessment, then you can move on to the plan. Now the plan needs to include these things. Number one is what is the surgical solution? So you got to put that. What are the preoperative needs? What is the diet? Okay. What is the disposition and what is the code status? All right. So the surgical solution might be laparoscopic appendectomy, the preoperative needs. They started antibiotics. They've been fluid resuscitated. Do they need additional fluid? Okay. For the diet, have they been NPO? Is there going to be a need to do RSI or rapid sequence intubation, which is common in patients with an acute abdomen? All right. What's their disposition? So, are they in the ED and going to go straight to the operating room or are they going to go to the floor first and then to the operating room or they, do they need to go to the ICU, right? And then code status, is this patient a full code? So you want to include each of these things, surgical solution, preoperative needs, what the diet is, disposition and code status in your plan. So the plan for this patient might be, I will schedule him for a laparoscopic appendectomy. He'll continue on IV cefoxetin and fluid. He does not need any more boluses and can continue on normal saline at a rate of 68 milliliters per hour based on his weight. He will remain NPO. He'll go directly to the operating room from the emergency room and he has a full code status. So this is how I like to listen to presentations. This is how I like to put presentations together. If I'm getting a consultation on one of my patients. Okay. So the two major things you have your style and you have your structure with style. Make sure that you're confident. Make sure that you're communicating clearly. It's okay to have notes as a reference. You don't need to say everything, but know everything. Keep it as short as possible, but as long as necessary. And then of course, don't ever lie. If you don't know, I don't know is the right answer. With structure, whatever structure you have, make sure you have flow. You go from the opening right down to the plan and you don't jump ahead and you don't back up. If you like this video and I hope that you did definitely subscribe to the channel, turn on your notifications so you don't miss anything coming out. I'm going to try to put these out a little bit more frequently. Now I recently put out that talk on tag, put a talk out on how to tie knots. Check that one out. Share these videos with your friends, get the words out. And of course, engage with me in the comments. I love it when you guys engage. I love it when you ask questions. So keep that up. It inspires me to make more videos as always study hard, be safe. I'll see you next time.